if you're going to buy into the idea of, of capitalism at all, mm -hmm. then you, you, have to, you have to believe in growth. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Ken Kirsten. He's the editor-in-chief of the New York Observer, a role he's filled since 2013. The New York Observer is one of the most vibrant and uh, exciting weekly newspapers in the country. Ken, thanks for talking to us. Thanks for having me here, Nick. Talk a bit about your vision for the uh, New York Observer, and I ask this p for two reasons. One is that as a young man living in New Jersey and then later in New York and working, the New York Observer was one of these great alt-weekly papers that defined what was great about New York. It had just rich voices, interesting stories, people complaining and kvetching and arguing on the editorial pages, great pictures by uh, Drew Friedman and the like. So in that way, I, I wanna know what your vision of this paper that was so important to me growing up is, but more importantly, in the alternative media landscape, it reinvigorated, along with the New York press, it reinvigorated journalism writ large in New York in the 80s and since. How do, you, how do you see the Observer working in today's world, which is much more dynamic than ever? You just gave like a, a beautiful preamble for exactly what I see. I, you, you called it an alt-weekly, but I, I think it occupies a different space. There's really nothing like it in the country. Uh, every city has its alt-weekly, but no other city has this sort of alt-weekly for the upper crust. And that's mm -hmm. that's what the, the New York Observer is. Talk okay. a little bit, but I mean, it's not something like you don't have to make $100,000 a year in order to read it. No. Although I'm sure your advertisers would prefer that, but... Well, a lot of them do. Yeah. Uh, luckily, a lot of our readers do. But but like I was saying, when I was brand new in New York City, I, I, I turned to... Uh, you know, Jim Windoff's off the record column, just to literally find out who was being hired and fired in the media. This was before the internet. This was yeah. when to figure out, you know, what, what, uh, Random House even was, right. you had to read the New York Observer. The Observer was the uh, starting point of Sex in the City. That's for right. For instance. So, yeah, I mean, this right. is the type of thing that it was trolling. At, and it seemed to be coming out of a kind of new journalism mode where the reporter, the reporting was top notch, but it was also highly personal or highly stylized and a lot of personality. Um, so what is its role now? We live in a, in a city and in a media scape where there are a few titans. I mean, things like the New York Times are doing well, but everybody knows that's not where the action is. The action is almost any place else. Well, you know, I think people are hungrier than ever for, for the sort of warm, intimate relationship that readers felt that they had with the New York Observer during the period you're mentioning. So I've, I've kind of doubled down on that. You mentioned Sex in the City. Candace Bushnell, great writer, chronicling her, her life and that, those of her friends. And so one of the first things I did when we, when we started was really go on the hunt for a, another great sex columnist. Mm -hmm. um, we found one in Jasmine Loeb. She writes a, a beautiful column. Uh, about what what sex and romance and intimacy and really lack of intimacy is like in uh, you know the mid 2000 teens. Right. Um, Richard Kirschenbaum, great voice in our paper, uh, chronicling the you know these incredible weird insecurities of of the ultra rich. Like one of his columns a couple weeks ago was hilarious. It's about how you can barely have a dinner party because this one won't eat gluten and that one doesn't eat meat and this one's a vegan and that one only eats uh, local foods and wants to know where the radishes were grown, et cetera. And it's 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 not just hilarious, there's a there's a thread running through all of this, which is how hard it is to find your place in New York City. So New York Observer is about trying to make that, that journey a little bit more. How, how does that play in the national scene? Because uh, you know that, that defines it for New York. And then what do you have aspirations for being a voice? You have, we'll get into your politics and your political background. You worked in, and wrote with Rudy Giuliani. Um, you know, what are, what are the politics of the New York Observer and how do they exceed uh, kind of being quarantined within the Hudson yeah, River? That's a great question. You know, the politics of the New York Observer are not my personal politics. I come from a political world and I think there was some nervousness or uh, raised eyebrows when, when someone who had been a partisan political figure like myself became the editor. But, uh, you know, everybody has their personal views and right. I, I try really hard to, you know, of course, they inform what I do. But uh, I'm one member of an editorial board, um, and the politics of the the New York Observer is is really where where Mike Bloomberg was. It's this sort of pro business, but but very but uh, anti soda. Uh, <laughs> if you would have seen me walking yeah. over here, I have a giant soda on my desk at all times uh, in violation of that. So we'll talk about Bloomberg, and and Giuliani was like this too. I mean, it's interesting because as he moved into the national scene. He had to, and I, to his detriment, he tried to fit more and more tightly into a Republican box. But as New York, in New York, what he was, what was interesting about him is that he was pro-business, but he was also pro-gay rights or marriage equality or whatever. 
uh, things that, that he couldn't be on a, on a national Yeah, I want to correct a few things. I, I never thought Rudy changed anything or emphasized anything mm -hmm. differently. I, I think that's totally wrong. I think mm -hmm. Rudy took a ton of flack in New York for being perceived as a, a right winger. You might yeah. remember him trying to shut down BAM for showing the, uh, right, the, the, the uh, Piss Christ exhibit. Um, and uh, actually, it was the uh, the uh, Chris of Philly, the uh, the Virgin Mary. Oh, that's right. Thing, yeah, right? It was the, yeah. the uh, Virgin Mary. That's exactly yeah. right. Um, but uh, you know, to me, he he stayed exactly who he was, and maybe mm -hmm. that was a problem for his presidential ambitions. Right. But when he stood on a stage of eleven uh, candidates, um, each vying to be more right wing than the next during these you know this endless series of Republican debates. And they did one of these gotcha, you know, raise your hands if, if you think Roe v. Wade should be overturned. Right. And he, you know, declined to raise his hand. I thought that actually was a, a great example of He may of have been, courage. along with Gary Johnson, the only one who also said that they believe in evolution. Yeah, I, which, there was a couple. Well, but to go back to the politics of New York, I mean, New York is, you know, Bloomberg uh, obviously is a billionaire. This guy knows how to make money. He knows how money works. He also was a, a nudge and a nanny. Giuliani had some of that. He famously cleared out Times Square went after the five or six squeegee men that were terrifying people coming out of the Lincoln Tunnel. Um, so what is, it, what is the kind of broad politics of New York? I mean, it's always a democratic city, no matter who's the mayor. Um, but you were saying that the New York Observer's politics are kind of like Bloombergian or Giuliani-esque. Yeah, it's very so pro what does that mean? We, we expect, you know, you say cleared out yeah. Times Square as though that, that's some sort of, you know, fascistic thing. And Rudy mm -hmm. used to get called these crazy things. But, you know, we're sitting well, here. Well, he is Italian. A, you know, that's why it's a yeah. cruel and vicious insult. That's right. but we're sitting it's here a, in a, a fancy slur. hotel yeah. on 46th Street, right? right. So the, the people coming here and spending their money here instead of going to Disney World or Disneyland or, or some horrible place like that are employing all the all the people who serve food here and who clean the rooms and whoever to, to me it's you know if, if you're going to buy into the idea of of capitalism at all mm -hmm. then you you have to you have to believe in growth and and if you reject it and you want to be an occupy wall street that's right. a legitimate choice but the, my problem with the people who objected to Rudy or Bloomberg is they wanted all of the good things, but they didn't. Then, then they wanted to wave flags when they didn't like this or that individual decision, and that's that's the part I, I could never get. Is it? I mean, but does New York have to? I mean, don't you find it odd? And you're a Chicago native, right? Or Chicago, yeah, Chicago native? That's right. So, um, I mean, don't you find it odd though that New York is like oh, it's the toughest city of the world? It's out of control, and then you have mayors who are like, no, liter literally, that soda is too big. You can't do that, or you can't have a strip club where right. you want to put a strip club. I mean, that, but that stuff gets checked. The Mayor Bloomberg's uh, attempt to ban giant sodas, which I totally disagree with. I, I, I not only personally love giant sodas, I, I, you know, I'm here because I, I believe in freedom and, yeah. and stuff. You, you came know, to New York for the big sodas. I did. I did. Yeah. No, these, there are checks on that. So yeah. he, you know, he, he couldn't get that passed despite all of his, his power. Rudy tried to, to do a thing where you couldn't jaywalk, right? He right. tried to put these, these uh, crossings of like uh, Avenue of the Americas in the middle of the, the road and by the way, we, we call it, never it Sixth Avenue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, it, never, it never worked. Yeah. You know, so is New York still the capital city of America? Absolutely. No, okay, we'll talk about this. It's not even worth arguing. There, you know, I was just in San Francisco a couple weeks ago, which is yeah. the only other city in, in the country that I could see myself living in. I, I adore it. But even as it's on, the, on one of these periodic rises, that's a city that's always in either total boom or total bust, mm -hmm. and it's in a total boom phase right now. It's just, it's, the scale is not so, there. But you're saying that, uh, you know, say Chicago or L.A., that what, what makes New York unique in the American landscape? The, the, the scale. The, there, yeah. there is every, no matter how prurient, weird, interesting your, your particular thing is, there's, there's a whole bunch of people who share that and are right there and have a group that'll meet about it. There, there are these, New York has a, a unique ability for a neighborhood to, to spring up and be great like overnight. I was, uh, on Sunday, um, I went to, some of the Observer got engaged, I went to her party um, and got the address and it's in Fort Greene. 10 years ago, you, you, you almost couldn't have gone into that neighborhood um, you Fort Greene and have Brooklyn. Driven, yeah, Fort yep. Greene and Brooklyn. And now it's this beautiful neighborhood, uh, beautiful people walking on the streets, every kind of uh, race, age, mm -hmm. income class. Um, you, you can't have that. Where so, I come from I mean, in Chicago, it, the neighborhoods that, that were horrible 40 years ago are horrible today. And, and it feels like they, they always will be, with you know a couple exceptions around those. So, areas. I mean, you see New York is kind of the, the paradigm of uh, creative destruction, the, the, the positivity of 
you know, capitalism and a mutation uh, of creative destruction that Joseph Schumpeter talked about. Uh, yep. You know, without getting deep into the yep. economic theory, yep. you just see it every day on the streets. You just see innovation, um, partly because you have to. It's, so it's what so happens? What, what chokes that off, though? Because, you know, there was a time not so long ago, uh, certainly in the 70s and a chunk of the 80s, where New York was dead. Or everybody just agreed, okay, New York was a dying beast that would give off heat for a couple more years, but it was over. What are, what are the necessary ingredients? And, you know, and this might be something both as the editor of The Observer, but also somebody who worked with, you know, a, a mayor. I mean, we could spend a lot of time picking over Giuliani's record, but it's, you know, everybody says, like, okay, the, the city did great under him. Yeah. So crime what are the big, rules? Crime is a big factor of it. Um, and it's, it's not for the reasons people always suspect, suspect. You know, in, in uh, four years before Rudy became mayor, there was over 2,000 murders mm -hmm. a year. When, when Rudy was done being mayor, it was 600. Mayor Bloomberg got that down to about 450. Mm -hmm. And it looks like uh, our new mayor is doing a pretty good yeah. job, um, despite a lot of fears and hand-wringing. Right. Over it, that that's a huge factor, and it's not because those fifteen hundred people not murdered between you know if yeah, there's yeah. two thousand versus five hundred. It's more that the the terror that everyone else feels mm -hmm. makes them disinvest. Um, so you, you made and a, you a, disinvest not just economically but kind of psychically exactly. in all not, sorts of exactly. every possible you, way. You might send your kids. You're you're not willing to move from your nice neighborhood in Queens, but when your kid says, "Should I stay here and go to NYU, or should I go to Northwestern?" You send them to Northwestern. Yeah. Um, or you made a you know, made a, a remark uh, when you were introducing me as you know Rudy got those five squeegee men off mm -hmm. it. it. You're right. It was a very small number, but they had a massive psychological impact on the, the exact people you want coming here and spending their money. How these do you know? You talked, and it's interesting to think about that. There there are checks on the more autocratic or kind of you know uh, bizarre impulses of leaders, uh, even when they're very popular. But you know, how does when does that go too far? Because you know, it, uh, you know, are I mean, we're in the middle of an on, you know, and it's every week, just like there's a new neighborhood coming up, there's it always seems to be a police scandal, uh, and there's one now. I mean, the police in New York are looking into using excessive violence against uh, you know a perp, uh, you know yeah. a person in custody. How you know how do you strike that balance between creating a safe place with conditions for for economic growth growth and tumult? and then it just becoming too much like Singapore? That's a bigger question yeah. that I'm prepared to answer. I mean, I, I see, I, I, my heart hurts for this guy who was selling, or allegedly selling cigarettes, uh, yeah. you know, Lucy's for 50 cents, right. and next thing you know he's dead. It, 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 it seems like an overreaction, whatever the facts are. Yeah. And I, the police have a very tough job, and I'm, I'm very reluctant to criticize them without knowing the facts. I think everyone, police included, would, would say that that, that, was, that was a horrible mm -hmm. outcome. Um, especially considering the alleged crime, it's too big of a question to ask me. How do you yeah. how do you balance the needs of, of eight million people vying for this very small right. physical space um, with with limits on government power? But I will say, I think New York does a pretty good job. And I, I just rattled off a couple examples of where executives push it too far. Another one is Mayor Bloomberg. Um, you know, basically engineered the rewriting of the the, the Constitution, the city charter, mm -hmm. for a third term. A lot of people are outraged. Right. It, it was the key issue in the Democratic primary this time. But I think there's a, a heck of a lot of people who are pretty glad he did because when he left office, even with all this wave of anti-Bloomberg sentiment, his popularity rating was about 60 percent. Talk about de Blasio. I mean, because this is, in a lot of ways, people are like, okay, we've seen this movie before where you bring in a liberal Democrat, or actually in the case of John Lindsay in the late 60s, a liberal Republican, and the city goes to hell in a handbasket. Uh, are, what are you worried about with a de Blasio administration? You know, I'm, I'm worried about some of the rhetoric, uh, Nick. I, I'm not that worried about Mayor de Blasio as a guy. Uh, I know him. Um, uh, you know, I've interviewed him. Uh, I moderated a debate, uh, mm -hmm. which he was like the clear winner and, and with very thoughtful, uh, measured um, responses. We, we endorsed him. Um, so, but I am worried about the did, rhetoric. Did you, you endorsed him in the general in election? The general and election. is that partly That's because right. there's really, there was nobody else well, his, his opponent yeah. happens to be a, a, a close friend of mine, um, so I wouldn't say there was nobody else, but uh, it wasn't just because he was going to win, it was because of the masterful campaign he, he, yeah. he ran. And, and I think that tells you something about how someone's gonna, going to run things. Coming from the political mm -hmm. world, I, you know, I put yeah. a lot of stock in how somebody runs a campaign. Um, and uh, I, I feel like Mayor de Blasio is off to a very good start you know, with the normal amount of stutter steps. It's a hard job, a complicated job. I am a little worried about the rhetoric, this, this sort of tendency that that he has to to play to the to the furthest most extreme elements of the coalition that, that brought him to power. Usually, you see 
you see someone sort of play to that to get their primary and then mm -hmm. you know sort of move to the middle to bring everyone in i think that's a healthy part of of democracy you didn't see that in this case because he was winning 75 to 25 the, right. the day he won the primary so you're saying he actually what is creepy or potentially troubling is that he in the in the general election or in, uh, he was or rather he was more on the way up he was more centrist and now he's speaking to yeah. a left uh, yeah. left frame it, it makes me a little nervous some of the the housing affordable housing rhetoric mm -hmm. around there is 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 really uh, extreme and and i fear would that you it's be able discourage. to convince him you know that these affordable housing scams are always they're always scams. I mean, you know, like, is there any way to actually get a, a hard left mayor to just pack it in on that and say, no, you know, the way that you create affordable housing is actually by taking limits off of the ability to build more uh, You can never or, convince people of that. It, it, it once, it's, it's unbelievable, Nick. I, I agree yeah. with you 100% that, that the reason there's no affordable housing is because there's no affordable housing. Yeah. It's, it's not because of the some supply is limited thing. Exactly. and more people you want to artificially be here. Yeah, limit yeah. the supply. And, you, and then naturally you create these people who will never leave their apartment if it's at all affordable and, and you, yeah. you have these artificial things hampering it. But once somebody buys into the idea that the government can put its thumb on the scale and fix it, you, you can never wind that back. And that's why it's so dangerous to start programs. They, they, they just yeah. never go away. Um, let's talk a little bit about your career uh, before, uh, you know, before the Observer, before uh, Giuliani and whatnot. You were in a, you dropped out of college. You were going to a, a I guess it's a community college because it's named after a city, right? University yeah. of Chicago. Yeah, it's a charm school. Yeah, you, you dropped out of that. You uh, started a band of some renown called Green. You started a magazine also called Green. Tell us a little bit about the band okay. and the milieu you were coming out of. I got I to gotta correct your chronology okay. a little okay. bit, um, it, which is that I joined Green the band, which I did not start. Okay. I joined Green, which was already becoming a, a sort of a local happening right out of high school. And I did that for four years before starting college. Okay. Then I did go to University of Chicago um, for a couple of years. Um, I think that's how I know you. Okay. Um, yeah, why, did, why, did, there. why did you drop out? Um, to find my fortune in New York as a writer. I moved to New York City to, um, to be with my, my then girlfriend, now wife, and to, to take an internship at Harper's Magazine um, and you know, become a media guy. And then, you, and then you started Green Magazine. That's right. I started Green Magazine while I was working at a company called United Feature Syndicate. In fact, the, the way I knew Peter Kaplan, who was the longtime uh, genius behind um, the New York Observer, um, is that United Feature Syndicate used to syndicate columns from the New York Observer. Mm -hmm. And I was the editor of those columns. So I would meet with Peter and tell him how I was going to chop Hilton Kramer down from 1,500 words to a, a more palatable right. Kansas City star-sized yeah. 650 words, which is brutal because every right. word that Hilton wrote was brilliant. But uh, things like that, or, or Joe Connison or whoever yeah. we were syndicating. So you, uh, you know, but you have this kind of DIY improvisation element to your to your career. So you, you know, you 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 decide not to go to college so you can play in a punk band. You leave the punk band, you go to the University of Chicago, you drop out of that, you come here, you, you know, the next thing you know, you're advertising, <laughs> or you're or rather you're running the um, the oh. New York. Is that Observer. DIY or uh, ADD? Well, ADD? What's yeah, the, yeah, what's, okay, yeah, sure maybe it's the, uh, we'll call it ADD. But is this the world that we live in uh, now? And is it a better world where you know? I mean, everybody is finding their own path. And you know, what is is there a through line to what you were doing? that makes sense and that somehow reflects larger forces at work in American culture. I, I think that this, this unbelievable emphasis on degrees and credentials is, is absurd. It's one of the craziest things. I actually think it's a scam. When you, when you look at what people do to their lives uh, in, in terms of uh, debt, mm -hmm. it, it limits their options. You're, the whole reason you go to college is to increase your options, right? right. So, so you don't have to work at a factory, you can be an executive. But when you, when you take on this staggering amount of debt, that limits your options, it's like you've defeated the purpose. Plus, we've gotten to a situation where the only time how you performed in college ever comes up, if it does at all, is like that first time you walk into a job. Anyone who's had one job never gets asked again yeah. how he did in college. So, you know, I, I got a lot out of college because I started when I was 23 years old instead mm -hmm. of 18. But if, had I gone to college like all of the kids from Glenbrook North who graduated with me in 1986, I wouldn't have learned anything. I, just, I was just too immature and mm -hmm. too too stupid. What um, do you look at uh, when you're hiring people at the Observer? You know, how do you, how do you hire them? Is it based on a resume or what? You know, I hire people who can write and who have passion. You know, we, yeah. we have all kinds of people at the Observer who um, you know, there's a long tradition of people there who who are uh, they're. Um, 
square pegs, right? They, they don't fit into it, and, and they go on to great things. This, this city is an all-star team of former observer people, whether it's you know Ben Smith, who started our political column and now is the editor-in-chief of BuzzFeed, or a dozen guys at, right. at well, the And New you York mentioned Times. Joe Connison, Joe who Connison. had a massive run in the yeah. 80s and 90s. Yeah, and Peter Kaplan himself, who yeah. a lot of people think was the best, best editor of the last 30 or so years in, in the city, and really was a huge inspiration and help to me. So do we live in a kind of punkified age, and by that I don't mean you know, that people are wearing razor blades you know, through their cheeks or anything, but the idea of like, eh, you know, you, you just figure it out. Like if you, know, you, you figure out what you want and then you go do it and make it work. I, th I think that's right, Nick. A lot of people were wondering how I could have taken off you know, virtually 12 years from being a daily paycheck earner in the media and come back to be an editor-in-chief of a, a respected newspaper. And I told uh, once, people- Once respected. Once respected. Formerly yes, respected. Formerly respected. Yeah. And I told people, you know, give me a year and tell me if the, the observer's uh, doing it. Mm -hmm. You look at my resume and it doesn't look traditional. That's, that's a very small-minded way to evaluate this stuff. Look at the, look at the work I'm going to do and then, then make up your mind. Some people- some people love it, I'm glad to say, and some people probably don't, but at least hopefully they're evaluating today's New York Observer based on you know, what's now a year and a half of putting this thing out instead of, well, he worked for this place instead of that place. All right, well, we will leave it there, and uh, we can check you out every day at the New York Observer's website and every week with the New York Observer in the print edition. So That's right. We've been talking with Ken Kirsten. He's the editor-in-chief of the New York Observer, one of the great uh, magazine or weekly newspapers in the country. Thanks for talking to Reason TV, Ken. Thanks so much for having me, Nick. I'm Nick Gillespie for Reason TV. Mm -hmm.